1893, an American mechanical engineer named Frederick Winslow Taylor started a management consultancy in Philadelphia. This consultancy was fairly unique at the time, specializing as it did in the systemization and optimization of management and manufacturing processes. He focused, in other words, on helping businesses, especially those that made things, figure out the optimal way to make more of those things faster, cheaper, and ideally of a higher quality as well. And he did so through rigorous application of experimentation, data collection, and eventually the adjustment of often minor facets of the requisite processes so that the whole business would get stronger when those tweaked pieces were then put back together and applied holistically. Taylor's conception of what he called scientific management was primarily oriented around formalizing previously rule-of-thumb-style metrics and approaches, hiring and training employees more intentionally and uniformly, providing very specific instructions and expectations for each employee, and making sure that those up top, the managers, did as much work as the laborers that work consisting mostly of collecting data, crunching that data for insights, and then applying those insights in a more scientific way so as to continue improving these processes over time. Taylor's overarching theory was that there was likely an optimal way to do everything, and the closer a business or a worker within that business could get to that optimal state, the better the business the better the worker, and the better the people on the other end of whatever good or service they produced would be. When applied appropriately and consistently, these principles did tend to result in at times significant improvements in output, and at times dramatically more efficiencies, especially efficiencies of scale. And many of these new efficiency-derived improvements stemmed from Taylor's aforementioned technique of breaking large tasks, or even the whole of a job, into discrete pieces, and then optimizing each of those pieces. Unfortunately, this collection of optimization methods, often disparagingly called Taylorism, failed to account for small, quibbling details like employee morale and happiness. After several decades of applying scientific management techniques to several industries, union organizers set themselves against Taylorism, as it reportedly made their members feel like thoughtless automatons who no longer took any pleasure or satisfaction in their work, and who also found themselves lacking the complex skills they would have previously developed working in these industries and working these jobs. After the implementation of these optimization-focused changes, workers were very seldom allowed to be generalists, and instead each worker would turn a single screw, or haul a specific quantity of scrap iron over and over and over again every single day, specializing in precisely one portion of one task, and thus becoming less skilled and less satisfied with their work which wasn't good for their psychology, but also wasn't great for their future career prospects. This specific flavor of scientific management began to dwindle in popularity in the mid-1910s, after some very public attempts to implement the system in government agencies and facilities ended with walkouts by the staff. But the general concept lived on under different names. Henry Ford, for instance, also developed a philosophy of production that was oriented around component standardization and the breaking apart of complex tasks into smaller, optimizable bits that required very little skill to perform repetitively. His model also required that workers be paid higher wages than was standard in that industry at the time, however, so that each employee could afford to buy the products that they made which were early automobiles, and that made his permutation of scientific management quite a bit more popular for the workers to which these concepts were applied. But beyond that and a few other largely superficial differences, Fordism was similar enough to Taylorism that when Taylor visited an early Ford assembly line, it's said that he assumed Ford was using his idea 
though it's claimed that the two came to these philosophies independently. As much as Henry Ford and his manufacturing practices and systems have influenced the automobile and countless other industries, though, Taylor's contributions to the world of productivity have arguably been more widespread and long-lasting. Not necessarily because his ideas were any better, but because he spread them through his consulting work, rather than applying them to a business he owned for competitive advantage. As a consequence of that approach, Taylor and his consulting world descendants were able to adjust their model to apply to many different fields, scales, and success metrics. They also weren't beholden to just one core philosophy and were able to adjust their own business models and client lists and communication methods as the world changed around them due to world wars, government regulations, and economic booms and busts. What I'd like to talk about today is another early management consulting entity, this entity's history of controversies, and a recent couple of scandals that seem to have shaken the company in perhaps more meaningful and permanent ways than those that have come before. You're listening to Let's Know Things. I'm Colin Wright. Let's Know Things is an independent, listener-supported show. If you're enjoying what you hear, consider becoming a supporter. You can find a list of ways to do this, both monetary and non-monetary, at letsknowthings.com support. But perhaps the most straightforward way is to become a patron at patreon.com slash letsknowthings. Folks who contribute any amount each month receive an additional episode of the show each month and a call-to-action and ad-free version of the show. A great big thanks to everybody who's already supporting the show in some way, shape, or form, and thanks in advance if you're considering doing so in the future. All right, let's get back to the show. The article I'd like to start with today comes from the New York Times, and it's entitled, Head of McKinsey is Voted Out as Firm Faces Reckoning on Opioid Crisis. The McKinsey, referred to in that headline, is McKinsey and Company, one of the oldest management consultancies in the world, and one of the three most successful and influential the other two of the so-called Big Three global management consultancies are the Boston Consulting Group and Bain and Company. McKinsey is the largest of the three financially, having brought in about $10.5 billion in revenue in 2018, while Boston and Bain brought in around 8 and and $4.3 billion around that same period, respectively. McKinsey was founded by James McKinsey in 1926, First as a firm that divvied out financial and budgeting advice, his background was in accounting, but the company then segued into holistic strategy and systems advice, in particular, how to optimize output and manage employees and infrastructure. Most of this advice derived from lessons learned in the accounting industry, and accounting was a service that they continued to provide alongside their broader-based management offerings. After McKinsey died in 1937, the accounting facet of the business was split off into a separate business, and the management consulting practice became its own entity. In the 1940s and 50s, this new consulting-focused business exploded in popularity, in large part because European businesses wanted to modernize their offerings for the post-World War II increasingly globalized economic paradigm. The United States, at this point, was serving as the factory of the world, and many people in many countries had very positive impressions of the states and its products, due to the incredible amount of new, relatively inexpensive offerings being shipped worldwide, alongside the wealth being distributed via the Marshall Plan. The U.S. military's role in helping to end the war also helped. This approach to management and efficiency optimization had a good reputation in part then because so many U.S. corporations utilized some permutation of it, 
and the U.S. at this point was beloved and successful. That national popularity and good reputation helped McKinsey scale up from 88 staff in 1951 to more than 200 employees in the early 1960s. They also opened up offices in major cities around the United States, Europe, and in Melbourne, Australia. And around that same time, they began to consult with governments, militaries, and defense contractors globally as well further bolstering both their bank accounts and their reputation. The emergence of competitors like Boston and Bain in the 1960s and 70s led to a moderate downturn for the company for the duration of those decades, but McKinsey eventually decided to spend less of their time and resources on expansion and the establishment of new international offices and more on specializing in existing and emerging industries. That refocus allowed them to reclaim their dominant first-place position in the management consulting world by the 1980s. In the early 1990s, McKinsey's revenue doubled, and by 1997 it had octupled from its late 1970s size. It began accepting stock in seed round tech companies in lieu of payment, hoping to cash in on the surge in funding being made available to primarily internet-based startups leading up to the turn of the century. This probably seemed like a really smart move for a few years, but when the dot-com bubble burst in 2000, the company suffered some fairly staggering financial losses, and its reputation took a hit as well. It had worked with about a thousand such companies, and many of them collapsed during this bubble-popping period. That reputational hit was compounded by the very public 2001 collapse of the energy company Enron, which had engaged in some serious book cooking that led to one of the largest accounting scandals in U.S. history, and which eventually led to the largest ever bankruptcy in U.S. history. This scandal splashed back on McKinsey because Enron was run by a former McKinsey consultant who worked at the company for 21 years before taking the reins at Enron. And McKinsey both endorsed the accountancy methods Enron was using, the illegal ones, and reportedly at least, McKinsey used the company as a sandbox of sorts in which they could experiment with new methods new ways of making money and finding efficiencies that they could then recommend to other clients if they paid off. So not a great look for anyone involved, but perhaps especially not ideal for a company that seems to have played a role in helping Enron develop their illegal methodologies and apply those methodologies and who then vouched for the company doing all these illegal things in a very public way. In addition to having been the incubation consultancy where the boss of that company doing those illegal things got his professional feet wet, McKinsey was also involved in the 2008 financial crisis, having played a role in the promotion of securitized mortgage assets that were artificially inflated in perceived value, telling their banking clients in particular to load up on as many of these toxic assets as possible so that their balance sheets would be jam-packed with debt, which then eventually led to a global financial market collapse when it was revealed that these assets were less valuable than their sticker price implied. This Times piece, though, is about a more recent scandal, this one revolving around what's been called an opioid epidemic in the United States that many companies have profited from, but largest of these companies and the one that arguably bears the biggest responsibility for sparking it, and which has made the most money from it, is a private pharmaceutical company called Purdue Pharma. Purdue makes a product called OxyContin, a type of painkiller called an opioid that is, among other things, immensely addictive and potentially deadly if a user overdoses on it, which is more common for this drug type than others because of that immense addictiveness. McKinsey consulted with Purdue about how to get this drug out to more people and more pharmacies, how to reward doctors for prescribing it more often, how to counter anti-addiction marketing materials with their own pro-OxyContin advertisements, and how to circumvent regulations that might otherwise slow or stop the production and distribution 
of this drug. These recommended methods were devastatingly effective, and OxyContin became what's called a blockbuster product. In just the six years between 1995 and 2001, this drug brought in $2.8 billion for Purdue, and the total revenue from this one drug was up to $35 billion by 2017. Because of this success, or rather the consequences of that success, including opioid addiction-related deaths estimated to number in the neighborhood of 450,000 over the past two decades in the U.S. alone, Purdue was eventually bankrupted in September of 2019 after a flurry of local and national-scale lawsuits became too big to manage, and the company was forced to both admit guilt and become a public benefit company run by a trust, with the family that previously ran it, the wealthy, politically influential Sackler family, unable to have any involvement with it from that point forward. McKinsey's role in this slow-burn scandal was slower to be recognized and punished, but was eventually acknowledged and criticized, culminating in an agreement with the attorneys general of 49 states, five territories, and Washington, D.C., to pay a total of not quite $600 million to settle the many investigations into their potentially illegal actions related to this larger scandal, for which, again, they primarily consulted with and helped Purdue and some other opioid-making pharmaceutical companies get their product out to more people, at times by circumventing the law, and at times by just being very clever with advertising, the spreading of scientific doubt, and the providing of incentives to doctors in order to get them to prescribe way more opioids than were actually necessary. This piece gets into some of the intra-corporate influence wrangling that's been occurring as a consequence of this settlement, the most concrete of which is that the company's top executive is being denied a second three-year stint as the head of the company, something that hasn't happened since the mid-1970s, when McKinsey was still stumbling due to its rapid expansion, declining expertise, and the emergence of its two main competitors. The current head of the company, Kevin Sneeder has spent most of his tenure cleaning up messes made by his predecessor, including the company's involvement with the U.S. opioid crisis, but also another headline-grabbing entanglement McKinsey had with a South African energy company that was eventually determined by the South African court to have involved criminal behavior like fraud, theft, money laundering, and general corruption. McKinsey returned the tens of millions of dollars they made over the course of their work there, but the then-president of South Africa, Jacob Zuma, was not as lucky. That same collection of criminal behaviors, which involved a local wealthy family, the Gupta family, and their tit-for-tat relationship with the president, because of that larger corruption investigation, Zuma spent his final years in power enmeshed in legal battles, and was eventually recalled from his position after a vote of no confidence within his own party in 2018, leading to his ouster from the presidency. Important to note here is that at the root of all of these scandals is the same general theme of scientific management-based efficiency of the same kind that underpinned the early works in this field, as seen in the efforts and ideologies of Taylor and Ford, but being used toward ends that many would consider to be immoral, and which the law, ultimately, at times at least, has deemed to be illegal. McKinsey has had its fair share of other scandals, of course, most of which would be more accurately categorized as being controversial or disliked, but not generally illegal. They might have made workers feel dehumanized, and they might have, at times, given one business entity a massively unfair advantage over their competitors, driving those competitors out of business. These are non-ideal outcomes for someone, but they're ostensibly what the client that hired McKinsey was hoping to achieve, which tends to justify both their model and the high prices that they tend to charge their clients. Where things get tricky is when we have a method of systematizing processes and improving outcomes, according to some metric at least, that are perhaps quite useful 
but which are actively harmful in some other opposing way. Companies like McKinsey typically take what they perceive to be a neutral stance on these types of choices, seeing it as their responsibility to improve efficiency, not determine which efficiencies are ethically sound and which are not. Likewise, they have tended to choose their clients based not on what those clients add to or subtract from the world, but rather based on who can pay and who cannot, a dynamic that tends to favor certain types of clients thus rendering more of these types of services to a certain type of person, business, and government, perhaps at the expense of all other types. For his part, Sneeder does seem to understand that the company has been at the center of some very questionable activities over the years, saying recently, after the company settled with the U.S. government on the opioid issue, but referring to the prior South African scandal, Quote, we came across as arrogant or unaccountable. To be brutally honest, we were too distant to understand the growing anger in South Africa. End quote. That same month, though, it was revealed that McKinsey was working with the U.S. government's Immigration and Customs Enforcement Agency, often called ICE, which was garnering its own press around that time for some significant human rights abuses, including putting immigrant children who had been separated from their parents in cages. Higher-ups in the company have also discussed shredding documents and deleting all of their emails and committing other illegal acts to cover up their illegal and not quite illegal, but still quite questionable, actions over the years. Some of these higher-ups have since been fired, and it's thought that Sneeder's denial of a second term represents a similar act of demonstrative apology for some of what the company has been caught doing over the past handful of years in particular. But it's up in the air as to whether these efforts and similar purported changes to their assessment of projects and clients before they take them on will amount to anything. It's worth asking, I think, how you put guardrails on industries that exist to think big and disrupt contemporary paradigms. Their job, in essence, is to take things apart and put them back together in what they believe to be a better way, better in most cases measured by time, resource, and monetary efficiencies, and by the overall benefit to the client paying their invoices, not based on other ideological, philosophical, or ethical metrics that we might use instead. This is a similar conversation, in some ways at least, to the one that's playing out around the tech industry right now. How do you regulate an industry that is supposed to break old dynamics and introduce us to newer, hopefully better ones, especially as those entities become more powerful, more influential, and consequently less guard railable. These sorts of lawsuits and the company's response to them are a step in that direction, potentially, though based on the number of lawsuits and criminal charges faced by McKinsey and their industry peers in the past, and how these companies keep chugging along, getting bigger and more powerful by the year. I do wonder if other thus far untried approaches to moderation and or regulation might be necessary at some point. And if such moderations and regulations prove effective, what we might gain or lose in the trade-off. <laughs> If you're enjoying Let's Know Things, consider becoming a supporter. The simplest way to do this is to become a patron at patreon.com slash let's know things. Folks who contribute any amount each month receive an additional episode of the show each month and an ad-free and call-to-action free version of the show. There are a bunch of other monetary and non-monetary ways to support this show as well, though. You can find a list of those at letsknowthings.com slash support. A huge thanks to everybody who's already supporting the show, and thanks in advance if you're considering doing so in the future. The book that I'd like to recommend today is called The Cult of Smart, How Our Broken Education System Perpetuates Social Injustice by Frederick DeBoer. This is a very challenging book. And it's not challenging in the sense that it's difficult to read or that the concepts are difficult to understand. It's challenging in that it is that rare type of book that presents 
a philosophy that doesn't cleanly fit into any of the existing predominant philosophies that you tend to hear about on different sides of a political discussion, for instance. And it's a book that, even a few weeks after having read it, I'm still thinking about and trying to decide about, trying to figure out my own thoughts on the matter, trying to figure out which pieces I agree with, which ones I disagree with, and why. And the core thesis of this book is that we tend to use a system, in the Western world at least, but increasingly around the world in general because of how our governmental and economic systems are set up, we tend to use systems of something like meritocracy to decide who gets what in society, and in fact to judge good and bad performance within society, within work, and so on. This, the author of the book argues, is not ideal. And in fact, the whole idea of judging people based on capability, and in some ways judging people based on their cognitive capabilities and their ability to learn and their ability to produce things, is in fact a horrible basis of determining value of any kind. Now that is a dramatic simplification of what the book is arguing, but I would definitely suggest giving it a read if you are curious about the oppositional view to the concept of meritocracy and what a system that is not predicated on that type of social categorization and that type of economic mentality might look like even if it's not something that you necessarily agree with now or think you would agree with after being exposed to those arguments. If any of that sounds interesting to you, consider picking up a copy of The Cult of Smart by Frederick de Boer. You can find out more about me and my work at colin.io. You can find the show notes and transcript for this episode and every episode of the podcast at letsknowthings.com. You can find my other podcast, Brain Lenses, wherever you get your podcasts or at brainlenses.com. You can find my news-focused daily newsletter at yesterdaysnewsletter.com. And you can feel free to reach out and say howdy on your social network of choice. I'm Colin Wright on Facebook and at Colin is my name on most of the other ones. Thank you so very much for listening. I'm Colin Wright, and I'll talk to you again next week. Mm-hmm.